Hello, everybody. The Arthur Lyons Film Noir Festival comes to Palm Springs every year at the Camelot Theater. And I was so thrilled this year when I read and found out that Victoria Wilson, who has written this marvelous book about Barbara Stanwyck, raves all over the world about this book, that she would be here and that I would have an opportunity to talk to her. So stay with us as we discuss Barbara Stanwyck and a lot of the world with Victoria Wilson in just a few seconds. Camelot is the place to go. And of course, these theaters bring us the finest in film fare from around the world, independent gems that delve into the arts, documentaries, and award-winning and nominated motion pictures. In addition to the outstanding film scene of the Camelot, there's always good food in the Camelot Cafe, as well as delicious cocktails and appetizers upstairs in the picturesque Cine Bar. So please remember that the Camelot is the place to go. I am so delighted to have Victoria Wilson with me here. Uh, she wrote this wonderful book, Barbara Stanwyck, Steel True. But there's a much more about Victoria that must be said. She is a senior editor and vice president of Knopf, which of course is a prime publishing company. She has also was served on a civil rights commission with uh, President Clinton. So there's much more to this lady, and you've written other books. But the Barbara Stanwyck book, as I say, is amazing. How did you get so hooked on Barbara Stanwyck? I was looking for possibly to write a biography, and I wasn't sure who I was going to write it. I published a lot of biographies, a lot of books on cultural history. And I made a list, and Barbara Stanwyck was sort of popped out. You know, she's interesting, she could do anything, she's not beautiful, but she looks complicated on screen. And, you know, she made 88 movies, she did 20 years of television, so it was a way to really, she worked with every great director, from Capra, Wellman, Vidor, DeMille, Wilder, all the way up, and uh, it was a way to sort of make it a larger book, a book about cultural history of Hollywood, and really what was going on in the world around her. Well, this is what you've done so uh, amazingly well. And this, of course, is what makes the book. It is not just a biography. It covers our world, really, from the late teens, the 20s, straight through to when you end it in 1940. Well, the subtitle was originally Her Work, Her World, Her Hollywood Through an American Century, but the book ended up being two volumes. And so I couldn't use that, that subtitle, but that's really what it was. Yeah. And, and it makes it so much better when you read a book and you go back starting in her early days before she became Barbara Stanwyck and she was Ruby Stevens and she was working in the stage and in clubs and so forth. And yet every Broadway show, Alfred Lunt, of the people who were starring, you talk about those shows and mention what was going on. You really, you feel it. You feel part of it. And of course, that is the secret of a great writer oh, and a great you. editor, thank which you, you are. Um, and. Before we go back to the book, as an editor who was so busy all the time, it, it's quite amazing that you were able to take the time, 15 years? Well, it took 15 <laughs> years because I was busy during the day. Yeah. And so I would come home at night and feed my animals and feed myself and do my chores and then go to work. And then I did that at night and on the weekends. And uh, it was, but it was an interesting balance because during the day, I'd be at work and working on books that were in the present and getting ready to publish other books, so I was in the future, and at night, I was in the past. So I sort of covered the waterfront. Yeah. Well, you just do it amazingly well. And there, there are so many things, I don't want to give away the book, but I have to talk about certain things that just amaze me. And one of them is when, you, when she is in Hollywood, and you actually are talking about the early days of Hollywood. And when the Depression hits, and how the studio heads, they didn't take a cut, but everybody else was supposed to, and yet Daryl Zanuck did something quite amazing that I would never think of him doing. Well, I mean, he basically left because of it, and went off uh, <clears throat> and uh, went to start a 20th century. But you know, they were principled. For instance, I tell the story of, of how the Screen Actors Guild basically came to be. 
acknowledged as the negotiators for themselves when the producers, after a long struggle, finally acknowledged them. And uh, <clears throat> what was interesting was that the great stars, uh, Clark Gable, Joan Crawford, Robert Montgomery, all of these huge, huge stars that had million dollar contracts were ready to go on strike, but they weren't striking for themselves. Mm -hmm. They were striking for the extras and for the B, the B character actors who didn't have that kind of protection. Now that's extraordinary. That would, I mean, that to me was just a, a wonderful sort of piece of discovery. Yeah, which I don't know that you'd find today. No, exactly. I mean, with I'm the glad you said enormous it. amount of money that celebrities are making today, which you just you can't even conceive. But there was a larger there was a larger cause, and the, and of course the Screen Actors Guild was started by people like uh, you know Ralph Morgan and Frank Morgan and James Gleason and people of that sort, and they were all character actors. Stop me if I'm wrong, because I got a kick out of this, and I hope I'm not wrong. It seems to me that somewhere in there, in the start of it. I was reading about that Adolf Manjou was part of that, and he did such a conservative switch that right. I don't remember writing. And, and maybe Adolf. I'm wrong. I don't. But I thought he was Adolf one of Manjou. the ones. With but him. I will say a great story about Adolf Manjou that I tell in the I tell in the book. I found this wonderful man named uh, Ed Burns, who was the sound man to uh, Frank Capra, and he worked on all of the early Capra pictures. And he told me this story that he, early days of sound, and he would have on these huge things so that he could hear people, you know, when, and, and during the breaks, people would be talking and they wouldn't realize that he could hear them. Well, one day he hears uh, Manju saying, they're never going to get the gold. This is at the point where FDR is taking the country off of the gold standard. Huh. And Adolf Manju, of course, hated Franklin Roosevelt said, they're never going to get my gold. I've got it buried all over Los Angeles. <laughs> so I, I, End of story. You yeah, never did exactly. find out if, if they found his gold or he had to give it up. Well, he probably <laughs> had to give it up. <laughs> I remember hearing stories that Adolf Manju, when he wasn't working, he would go with a chauffeur-driven chauffeur limousine to pick up his Social Security, despite oh, really? all of that. that. That's a fable, at least. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Well, I, I do know that he was working. I think he was working for Hoover. Yeah, at one point. It might have been Cecil B. DeMille that I was thinking of, too, because Cecil B. DeMille became quite conservative. Yes. And yet he was helpful to the actors. Well, he was against the unions. Was he? Okay. Yes. Well, it's all in the book. I mean, you just get an amazing, amazing history. Another thing that blew my mind is I've always loved A Star is Born. And the fact that, and you have to read the book to find out why, but that Part of that was based on Barbara Stanwyck's marriage to Frank Fay. Yes. That just amazed me. Well, well, it's a great story, and I go into it in great detail because what's interesting is I start, I mean, I sort of backed into everything, but of course that's the best way to do this. And I tell a lot about the movies that Stanwyck made with William Wellman. And Wellman, of course, was, as he was making these pictures, Night Nurse, the purchase price uh, so big, etc. He was watching this marriage disintegrate. And later, in I think it was 1935 or 36, he had decided he wanted to write this screenplay about Hollywood. And he went to he went to David Selznick. And of course, Selznick said, "Look, I bought, it's not. We shouldn't do it. We've already made what, what price Hollywood. It hasn't. You know, we don't need to do it again." So what did Wellman do? He went to see Irene Selznick, and Irene liked the idea and said, look, we're going to Honolulu. We'll be back in two weeks. I'll discuss it with David. Two weeks to the day, David Selznick calls Wellman and says, we want to make the movie. And so what happened was that Wellman and Carson, Robert Carson, wrote the script, and it was based on three couples. And, you know, John Bowers, uh, McCormick, and his wife, uh, Colleen Moore, and uh, also John Barrymore, and um, Frank Fay and uh, <clears throat> Barbara Stanwyck. So I tell the whole story because it's such a sort of perfect metaphor for Hollywood. And, um, but I really go into detail about what happened to all of these people. And then, of course, they're, they make the movie, and everybody's at the premiere except for Barbara Stanwyck and Frank Fay. Yeah. 
And I remember at the end, <coughs> she says, I'm Mrs. Dorman May. Yes, yeah. right. And of course, you bring out how she, while she was married to Faye, she wanted to be Mrs. Frank. Well, when everybody, when she, you see, she went, nobody really knew this, but she went, did uh, vaudeville with, with Faye performing. And they would always, and people were outraged that an actress who was sort of up and coming would be doing these supposedly outrageous and very undistinguished uh, acts. And she, of course, loved it. She was an acrobatic dancer that she was self-taught. And uh, that's what she did, and she loved working with him. And, you know, they would say, you know, basically, how could you do this, et cetera? And she said, you know, he's everything to me, and I am Mrs. Frank Fay. Yeah. And, and that's she... where I'm Mrs. Norman Maine came from. Yeah, yeah, which, of course, I did not know. And I must say that I bought the book because you Thank mentioned you. my father in it, and then I couldn't lay it down. And we'll get into that in a minute, but I am going to take a break. Do you hear what I hear? Do you hear what I hear? The sounds of the world are clear again. I can hear, I can hear, I can hear. Jackie can hear, he can hear, he can hear. Why? Why? Because you took me to advanced hearing, that's why. I did, advanced hearing, but we both got an anthem. We, we can, can hear. Spence's Restaurant at the Mountain remains a popular Palm Springs tradition of culinary excellence. With award-winning executive chef Eric Wadland, local magazine and newspaper readers have voted Spencer's best Sunday brunch, best power lunch, best wine list, best chef, and most romantic. Spencer's is a blend of stylish elegance and comfortable informality. Four-star American cuisine with the Pacific Rim influence. For reservations or to plan your private party or meeting, in the Bougainvillea Room, phone 760-327-3446. You know, for would-be writers, <clears throat> when I looked at, after I finished the book, at the very end, mm -hmm. and then I looked at all the credits, and you must have had thousands, not hundreds, but thousands of clippings in, in your research, as well as the, I don't know how many people you spoke to. You do not want to know what I have in my house. And I not only have it in my house, but I have <coughs> a house upstate with a studio, and I had to take apart my attic and put in, I had to remake it to accommodate this. And not only that, at a certain point, I bought 5,000 original letters that Barbara Stanwyck had written to Shirley Eater, even though her wonderful son, John Slotkin, had given them to me, had given Xeroxes to me. But I thought, I can't let this archive go. So I bought them, and then I thought, well, what am I going to do with them? So I thought, well, I'll put them in my lettuce crisper in my refrigerator, but I realized, well, that probably wouldn't be that good. <laughs> so what did I do? What would any person do under those circumstances? I went to my local Agway, <clears throat> and I bought a fireproof gun safe, and I took out the gun holders and put in shelves, and that's where the letters are. But my house is organized with books. I still have tapes, because let me just say that when I started this book, there was no internet, there was no Google, there was nothing. There was no, there were no discs. Half of these movies were not even available. I found tapes. I mean, I did it, as they say, the old-fashioned way. And I still have all the tapes, which I'm getting converted. And I have hundreds of interviews that were all transcribed. And I have, up in my attic, I have notebooks for every year. Like this thick, this high, they're about six or eight inches, and everything is chronologically uh, organized. All right. As the writer putting this together because you said you sort of went back. Did you start with the movies and then go back to vaudeville and theater, or did you start in the beginning? Well, I, in terms of by, in terms of, I mean, I did my research. I went to all the archives. Of course, I never stopped researching. And as you've told me, you know, your father suggested to told Barbara Stanwyck not to marry Frank Fay, and I. For 20 minutes now, I've been kicking myself that I didn't have that anecdote. But you know, you have a lot to of let people. These... I think told her that. Yeah, well, yes. From what I've been told, Arthur Hopkins also told yeah. me that. But you know, you have to let these things go. So um, anyway, I uh, I looked at all the movies many, many times, and 
sort of to get her inside of me. And the one interview that was crucial to me was when I interviewed. They were the they were the uh, the three girls. They were like the uh, the trio, and it was Ruby Stevens, Barbara Stanwyck, May Clark, and Walda Mansfield. And through a somebody who is James, James Curtis, who I publish, I was able to get to Walda Mansfield, and I flew out here and I interviewed her. And they were girls together. They were in that New York. The they were New York in my father's in, show and at his club. Yes, and which they were, is in your book. They were in New York in the twenties, and. Uh, my interviewing uh, Walda Mansfield was key because it opened up the sort of reality of this woman, Ruby Stevens. She yeah. was no longer just Barbara Stanwyck. But really what started me was I went all the way back. And you know, people don't know this about Barbara Stanwyck, Ruby Stevens from Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> but she is a daughter of the American Revolu Revolution. Uh, her family goes back. They were called one... One uh, descendant was a patriot pirate involved in helping America win the war against the English. And they came from an old New England family. In fact, I, so I tell the story. And once I sort of got back there, it was interesting when I went to Lanesville, which is where the family lived. They originally came from Maine, but then they moved to Lanesville. And I went there, and in the middle of this peninsula, right next to Gloucester, uh, there was a stone quarry. So I found out, figured out how the father became a mason. And then from there, it was interesting to me to see these sloops that would come in and carry this great mass of stone up and down the eastern seaboard because they were building <coughs> America up at that point. And it was the Industrial Revolution. Well, what was crucial about that wasn't just that it was the it wasn't just that it was the Industrial Revolution, but it was because of that 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 family left that small town and ultimately went to Brooklyn. And then the families fell apart. If they hadn't left, who knew what would have happened? Yeah. But like so many families that did leave, or so many girls that left their small towns. I mean, that's what Murnau's Sunrise is all about, one of those great classic movies. And it was ha and it happened to that family. And so through that, I was interested, I became interested in what was happening around this family that was shaping their lives. And shaping our world, you get into. Yes. And you bring, I mean, the, star, the rise of Hitler. And, and you, the way you bring it in is so amazing because maybe you're writing about a film that might have something to do with what's happening in Europe, and you bring in exactly what is happening at that time. And this, of course, is what makes the book so remarkable. Well, it was a p sort of perfect stroke of luck that, for instance, on the last day of Stanwyck's filming, Mexicali Rose, it just happened, and it was I was very grateful. Not that it happened, but that it happened on that date that the stock market crashed. Mm. So through that, because it was the end of that movie, she was I could make a connection, and then I started to write about it. And I wrote about it in a way that it would be interesting for me. So for any people out there who are interested in writing a book, yeah. mm -hmm. I have two pieces of suggestions. And the first is follow your instinct. Above everything else, just follow your instinct. And I just forgot what the second one was, but it'll come to me. <laughs> okay. But um, as an editor, a, a serious, really well-respected editor, Thank you. Uh, what happens to the person? They send things over and over, and then it gets rejected. Do they keep trying? Do they self-publish, which has suddenly become something that was always looked down on, but isn't looked down on as much with well, the it, digital age? Well, it depends. I just remember the second yeah. piece okay. of advice. The second piece of advice is write for yourself. Don't write for what somebody is telling you. Write mm -hmm. for, which is really the same thing as following your instinct. I mean, if your book is being rejected and, and nobody's really giving you anything that's uh, useful in their comments, then there's nothing, you know, you just keep sending it out. If they're saying things that are useful, I think you have to think about it. Well, even, so. though, even though you may think that the people are idiots and they don't know what they're talking about, Think about it, you know, sort of let go of 
your ego and just sort of uh, have some humility and think about perhaps there's something to what's being said. Well, experience means something, I think. You know? Yes, but then, of course, there is, you know, there is Amazon, and you can, but, you know, if you publish a book with Amazon, it doesn't get into any, what other bookstores are left, what other few bookstores are left. How do, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, it's just, I love to hold a book and read a book. Uh, I don't want to look at it on my iPad, and I love bookstores, I love to browse in them, and yet it seems to be... Well, I've heard, I've heard that there are no bookstores in Palm Springs. Well, there's one called Fabulous. Well, you know what? We, sh we, we salute you, Fabulous, for, for existing. <laughs> you're, you're our hero. Yeah. Um, you know, well, uh, hardcover book sales are coming back, so that's good. Um, but e-books are, you know, a very good friend of mine is that started a huge company that's now huge called Open Road Media. And she only publishes ebooks. Mm -hmm. So, and what she's doing is fabulous because she's bringing back books that have been long out of print. And, uh, but you know, it's just everything is it's just changing. It's sort of an evolutionary moment. Someone, but I'll tell you one thing. Okay. Everybody wants to write a book, and people still love to read stories. So, you put the two together, and you know I think it's just going to go on. It's just that, it's just that the form is changing. Yeah, well, I hope so. Um, something that was said by another biographer, and that is with the rise of the digital age, and people writing emails and texting and all of this, and not writing letters. That one of the great sources for biography. You take John Adams; it would be letters, and if the letters aren't written. You know, where are we going to be in the next 50 well, or 100 years? Well, that's an interesting thing, because yeah. if you even if you look at the emails, the emails are very short. So I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, it's the same thing as newspapers disappearing, because let me tell you, as a researcher, if you go back and you look at the, I mean, I love the New York Times. I will be forever grateful to them. And when I started writing the book, none of it was <clears throat> online, but you can go into those archives and you can go back all the way to 1887 or whenever the... And, and when you read newspaper accounts, the whole thing comes to life. It's like the world is still, you know, that time is still alive in those newspaper accounts. And it's crucial when you want to recreate a time. Yeah, absolutely. So newspapers cannot go out of business. All right, now you've done all this research, so do have you finished your research for volume two? Well, actually, no. Is the, is the answer <laughs> okay. to that question. I thought I had done most of it, but you know, as you write, you realize, oh, I need this and I need that. And of course, for anybody who's a biographer, you will know this as I am saying it, and that is <clears throat> that when you need a piece of information, you will do anything practically to get it. It's the most important thing that you have. And then you sort of realize, I mean, you have to sort of, well, what I did was I sort of trusted that the book would take care of me because there were a lot of leads that I had and I couldn't get the answer. And then maybe a year or two later, the answer would just appear. For instance, there was part of Barbara Stanwyck's family that I couldn't get the story on. Uh, she had a brother and she was very close to the brother. her brother. He was very important to her. He was really her family. And uh, I couldn't find, anyway, one day out of the blue, this woman calls who had been married to Stanwyck's nephew, the brother's son. And she told me, I mean, I became friends with her. She was wonderful. And uh, we were in touch <clears throat> for many years until she died of cancer. And But things sort of find their way of finding you. And you just have to trust, as I did, that the answers would come to you. Well, um, how many people do you think you spoke to? It's got to be about 200. Yeah. Yeah. And you might continue. And uh, there are a lot more people that I have to interview. Now, when do you think we can read Volume 2? Well, <laughs> uh, I don't really want to say, but I am about a third of the way into that book. I'm, I'm up to the uh, about 1950. So you're not going to take another 15 years? I can't. No. Actually, because there are other books I want to write. Yeah. Well, I think I am, as I said in the very beginning, so delighted that you were part of the Arthur Lyons Film Noir 
festival. That we oh, it's have been a wonderful Camelot. festival. And of course, you were here, and in fact, you were one of the speakers for the screening of Sorry Wrong Number, which was a Barbara Stanwyck star. Yes. One of her great roles. Yes. And then you spoke about her. Yes. Here. And um, I am just grateful for that. Because as I read the book, I thought, I wonder if I can ever meet this lady. She lives in New York. How can I get her out here to interview her? And, and, and here if, you are. If only I had known that you existed, because I really would have interviewed you. Your father was very important to Stanwyck and to Ruby Ste and to Ruby Stevens, May Clark, and and uh, Walden Mansfield. And the fact that that May Clark and Ruby Stevens, later Barbara Stanwyck, they never made up. After I mean, they were so close, and I kept waiting in this book to have them meet again. No, that does and not. It didn't well, happen. I mean, the it's, thing is, Stanwyck did talk to May Clark again. I mean, that, that, it's not that she never talked to her again, but that was really the end of May Clark. When May Clark had an accident, and it's in the book, and she received flowers, and I'm sure you wrote it that way, I'm thinking, they're from Stanwyck, but they weren't. <laughs> from Joan Crawford. Yeah, and you bring out some very nice things about Joan Crawford, which is contrary to a lot of what we read. So, I know, I know. My instinct about, look, she was not my mother, I don't know. <laughs> But my instinct about her is that she was not Mommy Dearest. She may not have been the best mother in the world. You know, and I should, probably shouldn't say because I didn't grow up with her. Yeah. I wasn't dependent upon her. Um, <clears throat> but she was an amazing actress. Absolutely. She was a force, let's put it that way. Yeah. Would you ever think about doing a book on her? No, I don't really want to write another. I mean, this isn't a movie star biography. No, it's not. I've sort of done it with this. Yeah. I would go into an, a, another world. And obviously when you get into Stanwyck in the later years, you will carry us through as to where the country is and what's going on, as you do so well. And and I'm going to write a, a lot about television. Yeah. Okay. Because that's because she was ready to to do television when most people thought, you know, it was it was, you know, for, in a leper colony. <laughs> most people wouldn't have gone near it, but she was ready to do it and she wanted to do westerns very early on. Interesting, really interesting. And of course, I'm very anxious to read part two to find out what happened with the marriage with Robert Taylor because that I don't remember except that it ended. It did end, and you'll have to just wait for. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I want to thank you. Again. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And it's been we fun. Will wait for part two, and I hope you come back to Palm Springs. Come back next year. Maybe there'll be a film noir. With Barbara Stan. Good. And I would love to. I love Palm Springs. It's gorgeous. <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you. And thank you. And we will see you here next time. <laughs>